My name is Natasha. I'm the Partnerships and Operations Coordinator for Atma Connect. And I'm Megan Reiner Gile. I'm a senior advisor on the Technology for Development team with Mercy Corps. Um, and on the tables, I've left uh, some copies. Um, we recently had a case study done um, with the principal for digital development, and then there's um, a two pager on our app, AtmaGo. Um, and I'm going to start. Uh, so, Atma is a nonprofit that envisions a world where neighbors help neighbors prepare for disasters, improve access to basic needs, and take collective action to overcome chronic challenges. Um, and so, as you all know, disasters are increasing in severity and frequency across the world, and with climate change, disasters are on the rise. And so, unfortunately, Puerto Rico knows all too well the impact of disaster. And so after Hurricane Maria, there were 4,500 people who died. There were $95 billion in damages, and 3.4 million people were affected. And so this is a lot of bad news, and incredibly, there's a silver lining in all of this. So, when academics look back at disasters um, from the earthquake and tsunami in Japan, Hurricane Sandy on the East Coast, and the heat wave in Chicago, what they found was that communities that had better social connections actually experienced less mortality, less morbidity, and actually bounced back more quickly from disaster. And so social connectedness is this incredibly underinvested in tool for resilience. And so what we've created at Atma is a hyper-local social network called Atma Go. It's a platform for neighbors helping neighbors, a platform where information is organized locally, where users are generating content, and this content is delivered back to people's mobile phones. And on Atma Go, people are doing a range of things. They're using it daily to make reports about hazards and get alerts from the government on early warnings. They are posting and reading local information from their neighbors, and they're creating and attending events, and they're finding jobs and building micro-entrepreneurship. And so because people are using Amago every day, it becomes all the more powerful in a disaster. And so people are using it at every stage in the disaster resilience cycle, and it's a ground-up resilience solution. People are using it to be prepared. They're receiving early warnings on Atmago, both from the government and hazard <coughs> warnings from their neighbors, where early warning systems don't exist. They're using it to respond in the hours after a disaster, before governments and humanitarian aid agencies are there. People are helping each other find food, health care, shelter, and water. And in the months after a disaster, once humanitarian aid agencies have left, people are helping each other in the long tail of disaster. So psychosocial support, rebuilding communities. And then what's really exciting is the way that our users in Indonesia have begun using AtmaGo to prevent the next disaster. They're joining together in thousands of resilience events involving tens of thousands of people to mitigate the next disaster by planting trees, planting mangroves, both of which um, reduce the impacts of storm surges and wave events and they're also doing garbage cleanups in their communities to reduce the flooding impacts. And so it's this incredible tool that is addressing all the stages of disaster resilience. And so we launched Atma Go in Indonesia in 2015, and since then we've reached over 90 locations and more than 4 million people. And so now let me share with you the impact that we've had. And so one of our donors, Qualcomm Wireless Reach, commissioned an independent evaluation of Atma Go, where over 300 users and non-users were surveyed and asked what they did as a result of a disaster warning on Atma Go. And so 30% of our users took effective preventative action as a result of a warning on Atma Go. They moved valuables, they evacuated, and they warned their neighbors. And then, so the evaluator, the Center for Innovation Policy and Governance, they quantified the impact that Atmago was having and found that per year, at only 10% of the Jakarta population, Atma 
Amago could save Jakarta residents $106 million in avoided damages, $4.6 million in avoided healthcare costs, and it could add over 6,000 years of healthy life. So we're excited to now bring this impact to Puerto Rico. And so um, our approach to bringing Atmago to a new location starts with human-centered design interviews. So in May of last year, um, through our global partnership with Mercy Corps, um, we started our expansion to Puerto Rico um, through doing HCD interviews with residents, government officials, and community support organizations. Um, so human-centered design interviews are really about understanding what the needs, challenges and aspirations are of people in these communities and how Atmago could be used as a tool to unlock their creative brilliance and create peer-to-peer -peer communication for resilience. And so what we found through these human-centered design interviews is that there's a range of information needs that people had that Atma could help fill the gap for. Great, and uh, so Mercy Corps has partnered with Atmago in a couple of different locations. So we actually were partnering with them in Indonesia when, when you guys first started there. Uh, since then, our program there has closed. Um, but we also then did, conducted assessments in Greece when we were working with refugees for information dissemination sharing. And so then when we both were uh, starting to work in Puerto Rico, we, we jumped at the possibility of, of working together again to think about how to have an information response to, to, uh, to the hurricane. Uh, and so we went to Puerto Rico with, with Atmago to conduct human-centered design assessments and, and work to think about how could the app support the community. Uh, in, in Puerto Rico right now, Mercy Corps is working with 14 resilience hubs to, to build disaster risk reduction and early warning systems. Uh, and so we're building capacity of those individual hubs to have supplies in case of disaster, to help educate the community about what to do in disaster. We're providing connectivity there, solar power, generators, and then another big part of that is to help build the digital community as well. Um, and so we're excited to say that a couple of the resilience hubs that we're working with have decided to adopt Atma as one of their uh, one of their communication tools. Mm -hmm. Yep. And, um, and so through the human-centered design interviews, here's some of the information that came up <coughs> on the kinds of information that people wanted to share on Atma Go. Um, and this still holds true. So People want to share information with their neighbors on how to prepare for a disaster. And so since Hurricane Maria in the last few years, a lot of community support organizations are doing disaster readiness events. And then they also want to use the app to organize community events like cleanups. And then they also want to use the app um, to provide neighbors with moral and emotional support. Um, so, because as you know, after Hurricane Maria, the, her the cases of depression and suicide increased dramatically, and that's still the case. There's still a lot of post-trauma um, that people are still um, dealing with and not really addressing. Um, <coughs> and I can speak personally. My grandmother has been terribly depressed, and uh, and it, it stems from the trauma from the hurricane. And so. We're really excited over the course of the next few months to be launching at Mago in Puerto Rico. And so um, what we've been doing in the last few months is we're building partnerships with community support organizations. So like some of the organizations that are managing the resilience hubs. Um, we're also building relationships with community leaders throughout the island. Um, and um, this partnership building process is um, very much about integrating yourself as a family member. Um, it's, very, it's a very intimate process. And then part of the, part of the process for launching at Mago as well is that we're improving the application platform and server resources to better serve users in Puerto Rico. And so we've been translating, localizing the app, and over the next few months, we'll be socializing it um, through citizen journalism and digital literacy workshops that will be held um, in partnership with community support organizations. And so we're already live in Puerto Rico. And so these are some of the posts that are on Atmago. Um, and so this first post 
is um, is about a community initiative to launch a community currency to reward community members um, on volunteer work and community building work that they're doing, like uh, doing garbage cleanups and um, and working in the community garden. And what's specific about this organization is that this community's been organizing for the last decade um, because they have, um, they live really close to a body of water that recurrently floods their community. And because a lot of the houses are not connected to the public water utility, they, um, they have a lot of public health issues from the flooding that comes into their homes. Um, and we're looking into partnering with them um, so that they can use AtmaGo to alert one another on flooding issues and also um, reach a broader audience in the community, um, events for garbage cleanups, which also reduce the impact of flooding. Um, the next post is on a, this is a public figure, Don Saul Davila. Um, he's been selling, uh, these are two brosses, Asusenas, for decades, and before him, his father. And so that article is featuring him. Um, and then the next one is an event on a art on an art workshop for adults in this community center, and it's being hosted by uh, an organization that's doing an economic revitalization initiative in Rio Piedras, which is um, where one of the University of Puerto Rico campuses is. And uh, what's um, what I'll um, What's distinct is that this community um, was super vibrant economically some decades ago, including when I was a child. And um, sadly, with the economic depression that Puerto Rico has had, um, there's um, very few businesses, local businesses left, and there's a lot of um, there's a lot of um, abandoned houses and. Um, so they're trying to reinvigorate the community there um, to take on economic revitalization. And then this last one um, is a post on events on Citizens Assembly, which after the ouster of the governor, Ricardo Rosselló, have been taking place throughout the island. And um, yeah, there's a wonderful write-up in the New York Times if you want to read more about it from in the last two weeks. Um, and so engaging the community in civic participation and um, bubbling up in person um, what are the priorities that people want to organize around. And so um, over the last few years, we've really focused on optimizing Amago for low bandwidth settings and lower and mobile phones. Um, we're excited in 2019 to achieve global scale, so to create an extensible version of AtmaGo that can spread everywhere, and we're going to start with Puerto Rico this year. And then over the course of the next year, we are really excited about exploring mesh networking. And so when telecom lines come down in a disaster, how can people connect peer to peer in that moment when communication is the most important thing? And that's what we heard from Puerto Ricans during our human-centered design interviews, is that one of the most important things after the disaster was communication. Um, and so what mesh networking would allow us to do is for people to communicate with each other um, through Bluetooth signal. So a message can hop from one phone to another and reach a range of 300 meters. And so this would allow people to have that key need met after a disaster. And so Atma Connect is a US nonprofit organization. Um, we've won several international awards, um, including the Urban Resilience Challenge, the Global Resilience Partnership, and most recently we were just awarded a member of the Million Lives Club um, just this week. And we're really excited to partner with Mercy Corps, with Red Cross, um, Ford Foundation, Vodafone Americas Foundation, and others to bring this to Puerto Rico. Megan, do you want to add? I don't think so. I think you did an excellent job. I'm excited for questions. <laughs> Great. 
So yeah, I think we have some time for Q and A. So how do you pick which countries that you're going to interview in, and how do you go about that? Um, I think we start through through our partnership, and then we we decide through doing human centered design interviews. So in this case, Puerto Rico came up because of our partnership with Mercy Corps. Mercy Corps brought us here to see about the possibilities of um, expanding that out here. Yeah, and part of that is in that human human centered design process, identifying what communication tools people are already using. Um, is there a certain level of digital literacy that's already been reached and connectivity? Are people using smartphones already? Um, and how you know is there a network in which we can tap into so that you can also reach more vulnerable populations that are not using those tools? I think one of you guys had a question. Yeah, you. <laughs> um, how you? I tried to download the app when you were talking, and it came up like all in Indonesian. In Bahasa. So for Puerto Rico, we're first launching the web app, and then soon we'll have an Android app. So folks will have to access the application through um, the web app. So you, and for Puerto Rico, you need to go to pr.atmago.com. Okay, thank you. And I think you get what you're doing. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. Um, I have a two-part question. Is the human-centered design process, like the interviews, is that standard in all countries you deploy in? And if it is, what are some differences you saw between Indonesia and Puerto Rico? Um, Ari, do you want to take this question? Sure. Ari <coughs> is our operations and program manager for Atla yeah. Connect. Yeah. Nice to meet you. <laughs> um, yeah, so the, we were really lucky. One of the awards that we won when we were a very young organization was through IDEO.org, and they are sort of the pioneers of human centered design. And so we were able to work with them and go into Indonesia, and really, um, we had an app at the time, and a lot of the work was done to. Um, test it with users and get tons of feedback and watch people use it and watch people in their daily lives and see you know what are their big issues what, um, how do they function in the world you know even like with their phones and so some of the um, so far I would say we've done tons of human-centered design interviews in Indonesia and one of the interesting things I think that is a difference that we're seeing right now is that in Indonesia the, the um, really local communities and individuals are the ones who are interested in, in using the app and they're really building power from their neighborhoods. And um, I think we're gonna see a similar thing in Puerto Rico, but the th what's bubbled up first is that there's tons of local organizations working to support all these individuals and they're trying to get their services to the people and um, raise awareness about you know, what they're doing, how people can access it. And so th it sounds like part of the human-centered design um, process has shown us that we need to build something so that it can be more of a two-way communication from the organizations to the people. So in Indonesia, it's very focused on the individual. And now we may be developing something that is also applicable in Indonesia, but it's more of a two-way communication. Mm -hmm. But is that something that you're rolling out yeah, so um, we, we're still exploring it, but um, what we're hoping to do is when we develop a new feature, we really want it to be something that's going to serve um, as many people as possible so we don't get too myopic in one mm -hmm. location. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so hopefully. Thank you. I think you have, yeah. How do you protect against mis or disinformation in a crisis context? Mm -hmm. So, um, sorry, it's just up there. But, um, so in Indonesia, we have community ambassadors, um, and, and then part of the process for socializing the app is um, doing citizen journalism and digital literacy workshops. So teaching um, the community what is a fake post, how to identify it, and also encouraging them to flag the post when they see it. Um, our community ambassadors, um, they also review and flag posts. And then our, our field team and growth team also um, review posts on Atmago to make sure to flag and remove.
fake and hoax posts. Um, do you have anything else to add? That when, when we conducted the assessment in Greece, that was one reason that we chose not to roll it out, uh, both mm -hmm. ATMA and I think we were in complete agreement, uh, because the amount of mis and disinformation uh, and, and other types of dangerous speech uh, was so high that the staff requirements and the technology requirements were, were too much at that point with where the app was in development and what staffing we had available. Um, so, you know, it was, it was definitely a moment when we were like, this isn't the right context for, for this tool. Are you partnering with interviews on the citizen journalism aspect? Not yet. <laughs> um, we've talked about it. We've, we've <laughs> talked about it. Um, I think there's more to build on that relationship. Yeah. Um, and then this, this sounds amazing. Um, Thank I you. I want to talk to you afterwards about maybe how we can collaborate with Habitat for Humanity here. Okay. Um, but so my question might sound critical, but I don't mean it that way. Oh no, please. But I just, um, as I'm looking at this, I, it looks like a lot of these things are people already do through Facebook. So how are you, how are you guys different from? I mean, besides the the pinging, the USB thing or the Bluetooth thing that's going to come up, that's obviously different and going to be really cool. So how are we doing that? From Facebook? Yeah. Um, we're very different. <laughs> Um, and so first, because our information is organized geographically. Um, so in Puerto Rico, what that means is that um, posts are organized by barrio and then by municipality. So if you're in Old San Juan, for example, and you want to see what people are writing about there, you can just, you can go into the app and indicate Barrio Old San Juan, and you can see all the citizen journalism, all the events that will be happening in the area, um, re problem reporting, and or um, jobs available. Versus Facebook uses, one, it uses algorithms. Two, you can't find information um, geographically. At least it doesn't bubble up um, things. I, I feel like for me it emits information at times. And then also you don't have to be friends with the users in order to be able to see the content that they're posting. To tack on to Allison's question, and also not trying to sound critical, but um, if it, I understand different from, from Facebook because information is organized geographically, but then how is it different from Nextdoor? Like, and granted, maybe this is coming from a place of ignorance, I don't know if Nextdoor even operates here. Nextdoor doesn't operate here, but it could operate here. But we are different from Nextdoor. Are, how are we different from Nextdoor? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I think, there, like Natasha said, there's a lot of ways that we're different. Um, in, in functionality, you could say, oh, you could do a lot of these things. There, there are some unique functionalities, like um, reporting on hazards and receiving early warnings through the app that um, we, we usually connect with government, local government, to bring in early warnings so that um, our users who are typically very low income um, can receive those early warnings. Usually those are the folks who don't, who aren't reached. Um, in an emergency situation. And then behind the scenes, we're, we're also doing a lot um, to make sure that we are protecting data, we're not selling data, we are, um, yeah, we don't even share data with anybody <laughs> basically right now. So in terms of being um, ethical, not advertising, um, we're definitely, we're a nonprofit, so we are a free app and it's for, we want to build community power, right? So it's for the people, by the people. There's no no ads, no um, no other third party influences. Yes. And oh, sorry. Oh no, please. Um, I think another thing to add to that is like larger companies like Nextdoor are going to be aiming at populations that are majority populations versus Atma, mm -hmm. which you know, given a context, would be aiming at the more vulnerable populations. Grace is very familiar with this. Potentially more uh, minority language groups. Um, so producing an app for people for which an app would not normally be produced. And isn't Nextdoor like exclusive? Like you can only see the content to a certain neighborhood? Yeah, yeah. So, so, you can buy it to your specific neighborhood. 
So yeah. Atma doesn't work like that. You, you can um, look at um, publication postings from all neighborhoods throughout the island, um, and you can post to them as well. It's, um, it's an app to visibilize to what people are doing to, to one another in the community and then to other communities as well. Um, and then also a big difference as well is um, that part of this community empowerment, we do digital literacy and citizen journalism workshops. So we're, we're empowering folks and saying like, here's a platform, um, share with your neighbors what you know um, and whatever problems that you see so that you can come up with solutions together and take collective action in person. And I think that's a really important piece too. Um, when we were starting to work in Greece, there was this huge proliferation of apps and they were kind of just rolled out and there was an assumption that people would know how to use them and what to do with them and you know how to operate safely on these things. And so the fact that Atma is not just an app, it's actually an app with people, um, that's kind of a big, the big difference there. So it's not usually about the tool, it's about how do you roll out the tool, how do you make sure that it's used safely and appropriately and socialize properly with the population you're serving. Thank you. So speaking of vulnerable populations in you know, Puerto Rico or Indonesia or the other places that you're targeting to launch the app, uh, are there only maybe a certain percentage of the population that have access to smartphones? And if so, are you utilizing the community ambassadors as a, you know, like a central hub for collecting and disseminating information, or is there another mechanism for that? Um, so that's also another thing that we look at when we do the human-centered design interviews is um, what is the percentage of folks that have um, smartphones and um, what do they do on their smartphone? That's actually one of our questions on our interview um, question list is like, show me what you do on your phone. And if you look at this photo, this is, this is our director do human-centered design interviews, and she has a smartphone in her hand. And um, in Puerto Rico, uh, there was an initiative through the Affordable Care Act to give people access um, to mobile phones. And so most people in Puerto Rico have access to smartphones. Um, our app is designed to work in on 2G phones. So remember the Nokia? It, it can work on those phones, and um, and then speaking then to populations that don't necessarily know how to use an app. That's why we do the digital literacy workshops is to be able to bring those folks in. Um, and we've also designed an app that is very easy to use. Um, so with folks um, with low digital, digital literacy in mind. And we do often see in communities where there are populations that don't have access to phones, they know somebody who does, um, and so there is that piece. Uh, but we also, you know, something we always think about is how are we gonna make sure that those networks are built so that there isn't some invisible population not getting access to services. And then something else um, that we've been integrating in Indonesia and we'll bring to Puerto Rico because for example, my grandmother who's in her 70s does not use a smartphone does not want to use a smartphone, <laughs> but she listens to the radio. And in Indonesia, in some communities, what we've seen is that um, radio um, emisora, uh, radio hosts are reading out the posts on Hava Go because since you can access it geographically, you can go to your neighborhood and be like, oh, this, this neighbor so-and-so wrote this, and uh, this neighbor is reporting this problem, and these are the events that are going to be happening this week. So um, integrating that as part of um, the work that we're doing is going to be essential. So I don't know, did that happen organically or is this something that? I think so. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. We, we were like, there, there's like um, a radio announcer whose name is Aldi Crayon. And <laughs> um, he, 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 yeah, he started using Abago in his lo local community and then started publicizing it on his radio show and other other people were like, wow, this is a great way to reach a much larger demographic. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
And you talked about geographic locations, that there are 90 of them, I think, and you, that you scroll and you pick your neighborhood, but can people you know, start their own? Like, is it organic, or do you guys determine what the locations are? How does that work? We determine what the locations are. Um, but we get, so part of the process of opening up a new location is having a user request that the location be open. Um, but that's for Indonesia. In Puerto Rico, it's gonna work a little differently because the metropolitan area, there's like seven or eight municipalities that feed into San Juan. So if I'm hosting an event in San Juan, there'll be people who come from Cataño, Caguas, and um, so in order to like keep that momentum going and let people go back to their neighborhoods and be able to start hosting them, we're gonna open them up. Um, or do you have anything to add about the locations? Yeah, I mean, that, that's actually another, to your question earlier about human-centered design interviews, is like looking at the local population and, and um, experimenting with what is best uh, in that location for how they want to use the app. And so what we've seen has been effective, effective in Indonesia is that people, um, they don't want to go to an app uh, and look at a neighborhood that has no content, right? So we don't want to like whitelist everything where you would like look up your neighborhood and nothing is there. We want people to uh, be really active, and then um, if there's enough interest, we'll open up in a new location. But as Natasha was saying, this um, the island is very different, and so we are going to be whitelisting um, much larger areas so that people who um, move around a lot can jump on that. And we'll see. Yeah. That's the way to go. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I have two more questions. Um, so you mentioned the evaluation was if 10% of the Jakarta population was on it. Did you also measure what percent of the population got on it? Oh, so uh, for the study? Yeah. So we, we surveyed 300 users and, and non-users for the study. So they, they um, from from that number, they quantified the impact at 10%. But at so, 10%. so is 10% an estimate of how many people were actually on it? Or it was just a, a hypothetical? 10% of Jakarta is about a million people. And um, we've, we've reached over 4 million users, uh, not at one time, which would be awesome. But uh, so yeah, the study was really a very, um, a pilot looking at potential impact at scale. And so the in the coming year, our next step is to take uh, that research and really do a much bigger, um, much bigger evaluation to see, you know, the real impact that was more of a projection. So you're saying that you estimate that you actually were able to reach more like 40% of the population than 10%? Yeah, I mean, we, we've definitely reached more than 10%. The, the way that the study worked is they just looked at the, the folks that were surveyed and said, um, of these folks, if we you know blow that out and extrapolate to a much bigger population, then this is what it could look like. This is mm -hmm. the number of lives that could be saved if mm -hmm. we reach that much. So we haven't actually surveyed 10% of the Jakarta population, but that would be if we can find the money to do it, we would love to. Right, no, I understand that that's how the study is. I guess my question is more around, like, how much of the population you're able to get to, you know, because I assume it's word of mouth, or I don't, I don't know how people find out about it, but it seems like that might be one of the hurdles to getting a lot of uh, impact, is making sure that you're, a lot of people know about it and are using it. So like what percentage of the population at a given time mm -hmm. they're in touch with? Do you guys know that? We have, um, you can, we look at um, daily, uh, weekly and monthly active users and monthly we're somewhere around the 40,000 mark, I wanna say. Here in uh, Puerto Rico? Or? No, in, in Indonesia. And we, okay. we are just launching right now in Puerto Rico so it's mm -hmm. like um, very small numbers. Just, yeah. yeah. But yeah, it's been ex really exciting because um, we, in, in Indonesia, and we're hoping to see something similar here in Puerto Rico, the first few years were, you know, we were building momentum and then um, 
in the last year we've reached we've like doubled our reach so in the last year we've reached two million people and it's really um, taken off and, uh, and the growth has been big and um, the second part of my question is if you could talk a little bit more in detail about what you have done and are doing in Puerto Rico so I'd be interested to know like how many interviews you conducted like how you decided who to interview and then also how many digital literacy and citizen journalism workshops you're planning to conduct and where and like what what will be your target um, participants for those workshops so um, for the human Center design interviews last year um, we went through Mercy Corps and we interviewed 16 um, residents government officials and community support organizations um, uh, what we've done so far, I I moved back in June because um, I was hired in California, um, and I've been identifying community support organizations that share values and that could see the use of of Atma Go to reach a broader audience in their community. Um, and building relationships with community leaders and that's quite a process um especially i grew up here but i went to school in the states and have worked in the states and i i thought that send an email they think it's great set the date for two weeks out for a workshop and that's not how it works here um community-based organizations are are very limited in staff and integrating one more thing onto their plate, even if they think it's great, it's integrated one more thing. And, um, and so um, right now I have a couple of dates, well, not even dates, I have a couple of possibilities lined up that I'm waiting on dates from, um, from a community leader in a public housing in San Juan. And um, there's, there's a lot of interest, it's just integrating me and setting a date for the workshop. Um, and then in these organizations, there's also a lot of bureaucracy, right? Um, and there's a process. I speak to the communications divisions first, and then they bring it to the broader organization, and then we set a date for later on, on when we're going to present Abba Go. And I've only been here since June, but I've talked to so many organizations and community leaders and um, it's it's slowly building a relationship and building intimacy mainly like people people want to see that you're around and that um, you hold to your values um, so and that's what I'm doing and I'm a party of one um, but it's it's happening they're slowly building the momentum start so, and yeah. and I hope that when I hope that by December I'm able to give like two or three workshops in a week but um, are do you live in Puerto Rico mm -hmm. okay then you know Christmas begins a week before Thanksgiving <laughs> and it's gonna go till the last week of January yeah. and so um, that's Christmas in Puerto Rico so yeah, just, just working around that and not being too pushy, but letting people know I'm still here and I'm still really interested. So yeah, slowly but surely. So do you have a goal number of workshops that you're planning um, to Well, at this point, I would like it to be maybe three workshops a week. Um, but that that all depends, right, if, if folks are available in the evenings during the week. If it's during the weekend, then it's possibly only going to be two, one on Saturday, one on Sunday. Um, so it, it depends on the community and the community support organization. Um, but as many as I can possibly get to, yeah. And are you focusing on the San Juan metro area or all three islands? I'm, I've been talking to organizations and leaders across the island, um, but I'm gonna start in San Juan first because this is where I'm physically located and um, 
San Juan and San Turce is what I know best. Um, but if the opportunity opens at another place, um, I'm going there. Yeah. Great, and I think we've got a couple more minutes. So I can be time. Any any last questions from anybody? Well, I, I have I did have <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> um, I was really interested. I love that you mentioned that you don't sell data, and then you said you also don't share it. And I was wondering if that's a, something that you're looking at. Like, if you had nonprofit partners that could uh, use the data in a, in a meaningful way that aligns with your values, is that something that you would do, or is it baked into your like principles that you just don't share the data with anyone else? We, we're okay sharing aggregate data um, at a high level. We have like a data dashboard and we've you know worked with Mercy Corps especially like to summarize all of the human centered design interviews we've done and we do um, a, a lot of uh, interviews and focus groups with our users and then um, so we'll share that in aggregate and the data from the app in aggregate but we've never shared like individual data and hopefully we will not. <laughs> Do you have anything to do with yeah. it? Great. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.